I struggled with, I was like, am I really gonna, you know, put it out there for a second? You know, I really, I would read it and was like, wow, this is kind of a lot. You know, I don't know how certain Christians will take it. I don't know how, who's gonna take it. I was like, it's embarrassing. I, you know, some things I was like, uh, should I take this back? Should I not put this in there? And then I was like, you know what? No, if it can help somebody else, if my embarrassing story is gonna help like another person, it's will, it's worth it. Everyone's life tells a story, or perhaps more accurately, a collection of stories. It's a personal journey that we are each tied to that's filled with excitement, wonder, fear, sadness, tragedy, love, and so on. And on this journey, there is no shortage of fun surprises or discouraging disappointments. This month, We're talking about the journey and process of writing and sharing your own personal story with the world. I'm John Marble, and this is Build Your Difference. This is Build Your Difference, a podcast created by Blue Artists, a brand platform with one goal, to help great visionaries like you build impressive brands. Every month, we'll bring you insightful tips, knowledge, and compelling stories from successful entrepreneurs and the Blue Artist team on how to create and market a winning brand that does more than just launch a new product or service. It starts an ongoing conversation. Because you're not just making a brand, you're making a difference. Let's start building. How often have you wanted to tell your own story? Perhaps in your years of experience, you've stumbled upon a new, innovative idea, developed a surefire way to improve relationships, or maybe you've created a product that could revolutionize certain markets, and you just want to share this amazing accomplishment with the world. For many of you, it's not enough to just live your story. You know deep down it needs to be told. But in telling your story, you have to be honest with yourself and to your reader. You have to be willing to be a little vulnerable. And that can seem frightening, especially to a first-time author. But when you allow yourself to share something genuine of your life's experiences with the world, the rewards can be endless. For an excellent example, we need look no further than Lorraine Chesley, whose new book, The Perfectly Imperfect Christian, explores her journey towards finding and reaffirming her relationship with God and herself in highly captivating, vulnerable, and brutally honest detail. A professional actress of both stage and film, with credits that include roles in Perception, Shameless, and The Fosters, Lorraine grew up in D.C., where she ventured into the arts as a child by studying ballet, learning tap dance, and taking singing lessons. She was raised in a staunchly Catholic family, in a church setting full of rigid rules and structures. I recently had the chance to chat with Lorraine about her new book and the journey she took to tell her story. Okay, and so you've just come out with a new book called The Perfectly Imperfect Christian. So I wanted to ask you here, because I I got to read some of of it from uh, on Amazon, I believe. I think you have a little excerpt up there. And... The first words that you write that stood out to me were, you know, I'm not perfect and made me think about how we spend a lot of our lives being led to believe that we have to be perfect, whether it's our looks, the work that we do. And, you know, your book opens with that great line of self-awareness and that line being, I'm not perfect. And I'm wondering... How and when did you come to that realization about yourself and what did that journey look like? Oh, well, thank you. You know, honestly, I didn't think about whether... I was kind of going on it, on that journey. I just, I always knew that, you know, I think being in the entertainment industry, there's always a level of trying to be perfect, but it's just not, that's just not attainable. And being in Mm -hmm. LA, you know, I've been over here for like almost 10 years. I mean, you can be on top one day and on the bottom the next. So this idea of perfection, and in terms of like with relating to the book, striving to be, you know, like Jesus or like God, like trying to walk in those footsteps. I mean, it's impossible. That's why he died, you know, for us, for our sins. 
At least that's that's my belief. So I knew that even though I can't be, I can aspire and try to like lead the best life that I possibly can. And I mean, I think I just, you know, growing up and being in it as I was an adult, I realized I was like, yeah, I'm not it's not going to be perfect. And that's OK. Mm. I love one of my other I love uh, Shay Mitchell is an actress that I she's like really positive about her, like her journey. And I, she always talks about, you know, it's just not the destination. It's, it's how you get there in the journey. And it really opened up. I think when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I was like, it really is more about like the journey and how you can get there. It doesn't have to be about perfection. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. And, you know, thinking about this topic of religion and, you know, knowing a little bit of your background, I know you, you, you are an actress, you know, there's been quite a number of, of creative individuals who found success in the arts that come from religious upbringings. I know you mentioned in your book about having been raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, for you, in what ways would you say growing up in the Catholic Church helped you pre to prepare for a career as an actress or as a writer? That's very interesting. I mean, I guess, honestly, the book wouldn't have partly even come about if, it, if I hadn't been raised Catholic. I don't think it necessarily helped with my acting journey, to be honest. I think it, you know, I think Catholicism has a great ritual and discipline about it. I also feel like it's very rigid. So that is like the opposite to me as being a creative artist, because as a creative artist, I like to be free and liberal and just really go out and push boundaries. And Catholicism to me mm. is not. Catholicism is like a hard, like it's a nice little square box in a lot of certain ways. It's a lot of rules. It's a lot of, you know, all types of sins that can happen. You know, it's just, it's a, I feel like it's very rigid for me. Yeah. And even going to an all girl, like private uh, Catholic school, all girl Catholic school, I was like, oh no. So I don't think it necessarily fed my artistry, but I do think it fed the book and that I was able, I needed to take a a clean break from it, honestly, in order to appreciate. Now I can appreciate. I don't agree with it, but I can appreciate why people enjoy Catholicism and the beauty and the ritual of it. Sure, sure. And I noticed you mentioned early on in that first part of the book, especially during those college years, you only, and I'm going to quote from the book here, called on God when you needed him. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a lot of us, you know, especially those of us going through adolescence and college at that age of our lives, we want that relationship with God to be a one-way street, preferably in our own favor. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you how did you experience that transition in life when you began to see this relationship more as a two-way street? Was that difficult? Did that come easily for you? I think the transition was actually it was unexpected and it was a lot easier. The light bulb went off when I found the church that I have been a part of since like 2010. Once I realized that it was an individual journey and it's, you know, about your own intimate relationship with God, it was like the light bulb went off and I was like, "Oh. This is a relationship I need to be cultivating. This is like any like this is the it should be the my highest priority of relationships. And as much as I give into all my other friends, and, you know, to boyfriends and all that other kind of stuff, I was like, I should most certainly be giving it up to the highest power. So it was like, it, it's like something clicked when I got into the church that I really loved. And because he wasn't like a, he was like, this isn't about religion. He was like this, my pastor, Pastor Torre was all about your walk. And yes, you know, the word and he would expand from that. But I really felt the connection when he said, this is about like your journey and your walk with him. And I was like, oh, well, I need to have, it needs to be like a fully fledged relationship. It can't be a one way, it can't be a one way street. It shouldn't be a one way street, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I love your focus on journey because I think that's part of the point that it's a journey that, that just keeps on going, you know, like, like any relationship, it's going to have, it's going to build, it's going to grow, it's going to have difficult times, but it's always a journey, whether we're talking about your friends, a spouse, mm. you know, your relationship with God, whatever that might be. So I think it's it's great that you're, you're using the word journey there. So the next question I wanted to ask you in terms of your book was, what was the process like that you went through to write this? Did you begin with an outline? Were you just writing every day, whatever you could think of? Were you showing to your closest friends and asking their opinion on something you'd written? How, how was that? I actually, I was journaling after I had gone through a really tough breakup. 
I had been journaling like every day and just about like that and like my life. And, you know, I think it was maybe over the course of a couple months. And then when I started to feel better, I looked back and I was like, oh, I felt like the Holy Spirit say like, this is a book. I mean, I had written it actually, like I'd even written chapters and I was like, oh, this is a book. And so after I was like, okay, let me try to put it together. I put it in a basic word document and sent it to a couple of my good friends who are in my prayer group and my prayer circle that I run. And they were like, okay. And after I came up, the title kind of just came to me again. That was very much like the Holy Spirit because I am imperfect and, but it is ratchet. I curse, you know what I mean? Like I'm not someone, Mm. you know, that's, I'm not prude. I'm not prudish. And so my other friends were like, okay, well, we need to still find a balance. Like they were like, let's not be dropping F bombs, you know, left and right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they were like, this is still, if you're still going to want it in the Christian inspirational section, like you're going to have to, you know, scale it back, which I don't think I had a bunch in there initially, but there were like a couple of other in terms of stories that I had. So I had like two or right. three really good prayer group friends of mine that read it, that they edited it. And then I had a couple friends who were not anything who don't like, believe in any type of religion. You know what I mean? They're not spiritual at yeah. all. And I had them read it and they gave me uh, some feedback and they particularly liked the friendship chapters and like other chapters, but they still thought it was very relatable. And I was like, okay. So. So your friends were able to provide a kind of filter for you. They were. Yeah. They, I mean, yeah. and I, I picked really specific close friends. They were able to really give me some awesome feedback. Excellent makes me think of another question. And that is, you know, I've tried a few times to write a book Mm. and I might get one or two chapters in of a draft (laughs) and I get my mind just gets so preoccupied with it that in my head, I'm already on chapter 10 before I've even gotten through finishing chapter two. And so I've played it out in my head so many times that by the time I even get to chapter three, I've just, I've, this book has just burnt me out. I'm, I'm done. You know, how did you avoid that? How did you keep the stamina going and all? I think because I'd never had an, I had never intended on this being a book. It was just me purely journaling. And I've always, I've always, if you just let me free flow, write, And there's no, like, I didn't have a real purpose for it initially. Hmm. It came much more, it came uh, much easier for me. So I, because it wasn't like a planned book, to be honest, it was something that I was just, it was very cathartic for me. It was very therapeutic. And then when I happened to go back and see, I was like, oh, this is a book. And even If you look at, when I look at my old journals to where it is now, it's not that drastically different. I mean, I've added some tweaks and like, you know, my, like when my brother read it, he gave me a couple things and he's really great at like grammar. So he did that. And then when I worked with blue artists, the formatting and stuff, but the actual content of it, the raw materials are there. It's not that it's so much that has changed. I might've tweaked some things, edited Mm -hmm. some things down, but it has not, when I look at it, I'm like, Yeah, this is, I feel like it's very authentic to what was in in my initial, you know, read. Mm -hmm. And from, and when you were putting this book together from a lot of the journaling you had been doing, were you at first kind of overwhelmed with all the content you had? Was was that a struggle to kind of, kind of chip away at it and get it down to a cohesive book, if you will? Or was that more of an exciting process? It was a little bit of both because I was like, oh, should I add this? Do I need to, it was, should I go deeper? I was like, should I go deeper with some of these things? Do I need to flesh out more? Do I need to give more like, you know, backstory for these, for these stories? So it was, um, it was a a lot of like, you know, a balancing act. Cause I, Mm. once I had it, I was like, oh, do I need to like, you know, cause my book is, it's, you know, I call it, you know, small and mighty. So it's 46 pages strong of, you know, like it's very like a, you know, intense, intense, and then you're done. So it's not something that's like 150 to 200 pages, but I was like, oh, do I need to like flesh this out? Do I need to do more? It, it was a, it was a balancing act, and that was tricky because right. I wanted to make sure it was still authentic to who I was. And I was like, I don't want to put filler, you know. I I'm pretty I'm pretty to the point. My personality is very much like I'm focused, I'm forward, I know what I want. Let's like let's do it. Let's knock it out. And if it happens to well, be small, then that's okay too. And talking about how you went about kind of putting this book together, was there a particular struggle with it? That, like, what was your greatest struggle in writing this book, and what steps did you take to overcome that? Mm, I would say that the greatest was 
you know, because the content that I share is, I feel like is very, it's very vulnerable. The stories that I share are, I'm very transparent. So I did, I struggled with, I was like, am I really going to, you know, put it out there for a second? You know, I really, I would read it and was like, wow, this is kind of a lot. You know, I don't know how certain Mm. Christians will take it. I don't know how, who's going to take it. I was like, it's embarrassing. I don't mention anyone's names. If you know me, you know, the people I think that I'm probably talking about, but I'm very, very open and I'm pretty honest. So I, you know, some things I was like, uh, should I take this back? Should I not put this in there? And then I was like, you know what? No, if it can help somebody else, if my embarrassing story is going to help like another person, it's will, it's worth it. And I was like, I'll just have to be brave and, you know, put it on out there. And ultimately, I think if it serves other people and and, in a great way, and it'll be a blessing, which is what I want it to be, then it's worth it. Right, right. So there was some concern about how some stories you share might be perceived by others. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. In a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how has the response been for you from your perspective so far? You know, it has been really, it has been really refreshing and it's awesome. And the great thing is that it's been positive from all kinds of people of all ages. And, you know, the one, a lot of people have, you know, told me, my friends have told me, like my other godmother told me, they were like, you know, I'm so glad that you shared this story. And, you know, they were like, thank you for being so honest and putting it all out there. And it is a journey, you know, you can tell the journey and my journey's not over, but during this period in my life, you know, it really, they were like, it's very helpful. They thought it was very refreshing. They thought it was funny. And, you know, if you know me, everybody has said that it's felt like it's me. It doesn't feel like I was just talking to a girlfriend last night and she was like, it's so you. She was like, it's so unapologetically you. And I was like, thank you. And that's the best, you know, she was like, I I feel like, you know, you are able to really challenge yourself to put it out there and to grow from this and to grow from the experience. And she was like, I feel like it's definitely going to help, you know, younger, younger women specifically, college age. So, yeah, it's been very positive so far. Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. And I think it's great that you, you're having feedback, especially from friends saying to you that they can see you and hear you within the text of the book there. I think it's very hard for a lot of writers to put themselves into the, into the writing that they do. And give that that authenticity, and I think that you were able to do that, and that's I think that's a a really great thing. Yeah, I'm very pleased. I'm just curious throughout the process of writing this book, what if anything have you learned about yourself that you did not know before mm. you started? I'm much more brave than I expected, and I and I have and I've learned also that God has me like one thousand percent. Like I can't fail because he's, you know, he's got me supported. I'm here on the solid ground. He's placed me in Los Angeles for a reason. And I feel like this, I feel like, you know, I had no idea that this was going to be birthed. I really didn't. And the fact that I'm able to expose this and, you know, to have my parents read this and, you know, I was like, okay, all right. They're going to, they're going to get to see this. Like they're going to be able to read this and they're, you know, either they will, are going to be on board and want to share this, you know, with their other friends and family and stuff or not. And my parents have always been super, super, super supportive. You know, they are, yeah, I'm very blessed. I'm That's very great. fortunate yeah. that ever since, you know, they've always been, they've backed me like a hundred percent acting, whatever it is. They're always there to be like, yes, you can do it. Of course you can do it. But yeah, that was the main thing. I learned that I was like, wow, I'm a lot stronger and even more brave than I thought I really was. Wow. So it kind of gave you, or or you already had it, but it, it illuminated the, the amount of confidence and bravery that you have. It did in this kind of way, because this is me. When I'm playing a character, it's not me. I don't care about, you know what I mean? That's the, I think that was mm-hmm. the difference. This is the first time that I've stepped out and it's like, you know... I'm not playing a character. The flaws and stuff, the characters that I played are amazing. And I'm like, not me though. That's their life, not mine. This is a hundred percent my life. And I had to take ownership of that and that it's out there for every, like my mom, when, when she first read it, was like, Oh my goodness. She was like, Lorraine, she was like, you are just so, uh, crass. <laughs> she was like, this is so, she was like, you're just really raw. And, and I, she was like, you know, this is you, this is not a character that you're playing. She was like, this is you. And it's out there for forever. And, you know, and I was like, oh, yeah, that is a huge difference. I don't think I even really factored that in because she read it early on. 
And she was like, oh my goodness. But I was like, okay. So, so was your mother nervous about that, that, that kind of raw honesty being put out there? I think she was surprised. I think she was like, oh, I, she wasn't, cause she's not, my mom's not a prude either, but she, uh, it was shocking to me when I first read her initial email and she was like, it really is ratchet. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. I thought yeah. it was hysterical. That she was like, "It really is rad." She was like, "You really are, you know." And even other my other cousins on my dad's side, when they like messaged me, they were like, "You are really transparent, girl." <laughs> you know. So you know, I knew I was going to be faced with that. You know, because I talk about you know my like my sex journey and you know how you know like I go through all of yeah. that. And you know, to be considered, you know, I guess if it's going to be put in the you know the Christian or the inspiration, it's like you know. But you got to be honest about it. It's not like people aren't having sex. It's not like people aren't doing these things. And this was my journey and how I did things. So, you know. Right, right. And I would imagine to to have some sort of truth in their authenticity that it needs to be rather transparent, right? Or otherwise, yeah. it loses a bit of that, I think. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You had talked earlier about, you know, obviously in the book – a lot of references to personal stories of yours that involve other people and that, of course, you don't give out names, obviously. Mm -hmm. But was that a challenge for you? Because the book is so personal and involves experiences with other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it a challenge to, to try to write that in and still be honest, but with without encroaching on that other person's kind of personal space, if you will? Yeah. How, how, did, how did you navigate that? You know what? Uh... When I was free, when I was like free journaling and stuff, I had all their names and that kind of thing. I, I feel like at least for a couple stories. And then when I went back, I was like, okay, we'll take out this, add this. And the other thing is I had to debate whether there was one particular story where I was like, there was such a great, there was set, I could give away the nickname that we used to call this one girl, but it just would immediately out her and that just wouldn't, I was like, that's not fair. I can't do that. So yeah, of course my right. friend was like, I mean, you could. <laughs> and I was like, I, won't <laughs> I was like, I won't do that. Right. That, well, that could be, what is it called? Um, you know, you could always go ahead and, and ask for forgiveness later. Right. right. I mean, I, I 100% could have done that, but I will say I tried to be, and that's why I said I tried to make it more about the relationship that I have with God. Now he's getting me through the story as opposed to, you know, either berating the person or belittling them or, you know what I mean? Because it, it wasn't really about, it wasn't about the other person as much as it was about me. And, you know, if I were listening to God or more in tuned and more aligned with what God was telling me or what I could feel the Holy Spirit pushing me to do, then, you know, these situations possibly couldn't have arisen. And that's okay. But it was tricky trying to figure out sometimes, like, like I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I don't, and, and I didn't want to give, I didn't want to give any kind of physical characteristics or even if I said specific phrases, because so many of my, you know, friends would know like, oh, that's that person. You use that specific word, that's yeah. them. You know what I mean? So I would try to be as specific, but vague at the same time, which is a, that's a tricky balance. So I give it up to playwrights and screenwriters who have to really focus and you know, if they're taking things from their real lives, because that it can be challenging. Mm. Yeah. So with with the quotes and everything, were, did you have to kind of come up with different ones that were similar to what the person in your life would have said or just leave the quote out completely to avoid exposing that person? I just kind of tweaked it so that it would be appropriate for the in terms of like vocab. So that because some of the stuff was just like it was just too vulgar, I think, honestly. So mm, I kind of right. modified so that it was still authentic, but like we tweak like a word or two. And I'm trying to think, because I don't think I quote, quote, I, I usually tell like, like the story about, or I have like a couple quotes, but most of them, which is why I try not to directly quote anyone, because then I'd, I'd want to use the specific quotes that I, you know, actually heard. Right. And for, for any readers out there, or, and also for our listeners, do you have any advice for those aspiring writers or for any young people who might be struggling to figure out what role the church and God have in their lives? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think journaling is an excellent way to just get out your thoughts. So I say 
If you can journal at least 10 minutes a day, I think that is just a great practice to do, especially for writers. Cause then you can just, and it doesn't have to be about any topic. It can just be about whatever you want. I think there's a freedom in that and creativity. Mm. And also when it comes to like religion and stuff, take a step back. Sometimes you need, you know, clarity. And the only way to do that is to take an, you know, like an, a focused break. And that's kind of, I mean, I did it in college, you know, I think out of rebellion, honestly, because I was like, I'm over it. I'm not going to church every Sunday. I, I refuse to have to be forced to do something that I just don't like, like or believe or whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that was me too. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, I just could not. So, but then, you know, circle back, you know, seven years later or whenever, and I was like, okay, I feel ready. So sometimes you just need a little break and have, you know, some time with you. And it doesn't mean I didn't stop believing. I always knew that there was God mm. and there was a higher power. I was, I always believed in that. But I think sometimes you just need to take a couple steps back, breathe, and then go, you know, like back in and find something that feels, you know, just kind of organic to you, whether it's being out in nature, you know, feeling, you know, God's presence, whether it's journaling for 10 minutes somewhere else, you know, in a park, but I feel like taking a break is really healthy. Now, one thing I was I was thinking about when I was, you know, looking at looking at the book was and knowing some of your background, having worked as an actress, how did you balance your time between any productions you might be having to be a part of and then getting this book in, getting getting it written and getting it published? Where how did you balance all that? Uh, now that I will say that was actually, it's funny. Writing it was not hard. Doing this part was extremely tough for me because I'd never ventured into anything like this before. So it was tough because I was doing like, I did two shows. I think I was doing, I was still working on it during when I was doing smart people at arena stage. And then even when, even just this past, uh, spring, I was at Miramac repertory theater doing a show and like, I was like giving notes and like trying to, you know, it, it was, it was tough because when you're in rehearsal and they're intense shows, the two, the two last shows that I did were very either text or physically challenging. Mm. And so to try to balance that, it was, it was tough. And I had to put things on hold. I, I mean, like when I'm in shows and because I like to really give my all, I will throw, I throw everything else, you know, out and I focus on the process at hand. Until once the show is up and running, then I have more time to breathe again because I'm not in rehearsal all day. So, you know, there were months, there were a couple months when I would just like, I would not do anything with the book. I wouldn't, you know, be responding as much, you know, with the public, with like the publishers or, you know, I would just be behind and giving feedback or whatever. And, you know, it just delayed it. I feel like I probably, I could have gotten things done a little bit quicker, but you know, when you're having to balance you know, acting jobs and just regular life. It was, that was, that was challenging because things got put on a back burner and then other things took precedent. And then I was like, but I want the book to be done. So I told myself, okay, after I finished the show in May, I was like, I have to finish and I want the book out. I was like, and late summer. And I did. I, and I, and like, I pushed forward and I was like, look guys, I'm sorry. I'm back. I'm here to focus. And I want to get this out so that I can have the book launch party by, you know, even if it and it ended up it ended up actually being the last day of summer, so it was perfect. No, oh, nice. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to end the summer. It really was because I was like, okay, I was like, I really want, I really wanted to do it, and I really wanted to hold myself accountable because I was like, enough. It's been like a year, and I have no mm. idea how you know how this really operates. But I was like, I know that I need to finish this, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel good if I if if stuff was just lingering again, or if I waited until the next year, no, get it done now. <laughs> right, right. And this experience for you, has it kind of left you feeling encouraged to perhaps later down the line, write another book? Or do you think this is a one-off for you? No, you know what? I actually think it did open up. Uh, it's amazing. I it, it did make me open up and realize like, oh, I like this. I don't, you know, like, I, I don't know if I'll, it might not be as, free flowing. I might have maybe like a part two. I'm not really sure at the moment, but I always, I always journal. I always, you know, make sure that I'm somehow creatively, you know, engaged, but I don't think it's a one-off. I feel like this has opened the doors for me that I'm like, oh, 
And now that I've done the process once it, you know what I mean? Like now I'm like, okay, I kind of get it. I see what's happening. Right. Okay. Now I know as I move forward, what to do. Yeah. You know what to expect now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Could you possibly see something like this transitioning into say, and you may have already done some of this, I'm not sure, into a screenwriting perhaps for, for future shows? I definitely want to take this book for sure. And I want it, to, I'm going to move it into some sort of, I don't know if it's going to be a, a feature length, if it's going to be some sort of, you know, TV show or web series, but I do want it, this, this specifically, this book, I want it to be filmed or documented. It should blossom. I want it, I want it to be into that. Screen. I don't know if I, I, I don't even know if I would do, I would get some other writers because I have some other really great friends who are writers uh, to help me with it because mm-hmm. I don't even really consider myself. It's funny. I don't really consider myself a writer. I consider myself a creative and I consider myself like an actress because that's what I've trained in. It's what I feel the most comfortable in. I think writing this was another aspect and an extension of my artistry, but I would never be like, yeah, I'm a writer. I don't, I just don't see myself that way, you know? Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So would that, you think that would change if you had maybe three or five books under your belt or is, is it just, you know, you prefer to see it as just one of your many creative outlets? You know, that's so, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. if I mean, maybe, but maybe if I did three or yeah, maybe if I did more, I'd be like, yeah, I'm a writer. I don't know. It just seems it's so bizarre to me in a certain way because because I I just never would have expected it. But part of me is like, yeah, I guess I should own up. It's like, yeah, you are, you are a published author. So, I mean, yes, but I guess because acting, well, well, there you go. I was like, I guess, you know, that is, that is it. Yes. But I guess because I have seen myself for so long as an actress and a teacher and maybe because it just comes more Mm. naturally to me, but you know, why not? <laughs> what was the most enjoyable part of writing this book? Whether we're talking about the process or we're talking about is there a particular chapter or content that you enjoyed the most when you were writing this? Oh, you know what? I, I do. I do remember really liking uh, when I talk about in the chapter, like friendships, I talk about in the spirit of gratitude and I talk about my brother and because he's been such a, such a powerful force in my life, my younger brother he, you know, we really like, I really did not want a younger brother growing up. I don't want any younger anything. I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, why do we need another when they, I remember my parents told me that. Like, so you're going to have like, you know, a younger, you know, sibling. And I think they said brother. And I was like, what? I was like, un- I was like, unbelievable. I'm not enough. I was like, and, and it's not even a sister. I was like, you guys are really messing up. People. <laughs> unacceptable. 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 <laughs> unacceptable. But then you know, after we got through kind of like the annoying years of growing up, you know, being in a household together, when I went away to college and then I came back, I was like, oh, he is pretty damn cool. I was like, okay. And then from there, when he went to college and then, you know, living apart from each other for so long, it really did kind of like strengthen our bond. And he really has, you know, he's one of my best friends and now he's out in LA with me and it's like magical. You know, I I mean, it really takes time to like develop. It's kind of like, you know, you're watering this, this flower and you're watching it bloom. So, but that was, I loved, I will say I loved writing that because he's such, you know, he's such a a dynamic, you know, person and he's funny. He's so funny. And, and he's, you know, he's very wise. I'm always like, I can't believe that you're the, uh, the younger sibling. (laughs) So (laughs) Yeah. But that but that's so true so true though, isn't it? Cuz it's actually the reverse for me. I'm the youngest and my brother is the mm. older of the two of us. And of course, you know, how many years was I getting, you know, lovingly beat on by by the bigger brother, if oh, you know yeah, what I mean, absolutely. you know. I did. That's that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, and of course right, and of course now we are we're so much more alike than we used to be and, you know, get along fine it seems and all that stuff and it's it's funny how we all go through that phase especially if we have s- siblings and i guess being the younger of the two i always wanted to have uh, a young a sibling younger than me so i could probably have somebody to boss around yeah <laughs> so. yeah it was very fun bossing <laughs> i still i still oh, I, I I bet. Do. <laughs> 
right? I, I, I bet. Luckily, he, he doesn't try to do that on, with me anymore. So, That's good. but uh, now I know you're you're out in LA, but are you originally from LA or are you from from elsewhere in the states? I'm originally from right outside of DC. So I'm I grew up okay. in uh, like Silver Spring and PG County, mm-hmm. in okay. Maryland. Yeah. Okay. Was that a bit of a not, I don't want to say culture shock because, of course, it's more or less the same culture, obviously. But, you know, from, from East Coast to West Coast, was that a, a jarring change or was it filled with excitement or how did that, how was that for you? You know, no, I think you're right to say uh, actually culture because it is. It's a different type of, it is a different type of mm. culture. I mean, East Coast and the West Coast are just, they're just completely different. And it took me, it, it was actually, I always wanted to be in LA. Like, I always know I was like, I'm going to go to be in LA and I'm going to be an actress. And so that was always at the forefront of my mind. But uh, my parents like, well, you will be going to college. And so I was like, oh, okay. So that was like, oh, I'm not going to LA right after <laughs> like, you know, high school. And they were like, well, no, you're going to college. And so they were like, you can major in theater, you know, but you will have an education. And so from there, I even, I wanted to be done after undergrad, but then another professor was like, Lorraine, I really think you can mine your potential in acting. He was like, look at some really good grad schools. He was like, even if they're on the West coast, he was like, you know, so I did. And I was like, you know what? Okay. That is a good compromise. At least I'll be on the West coast so I can get closer to my dream of LA. So, and it was smart. Mm. So I went to San Diego first, cause that's where I went to grad school to university of California in San Diego. And now that was much more of a shock to me than LA, I guess, first coming from the East Coast, because I was like, whoa, why is everybody moving so extremely slow? It's so casual, like laid back. I was like, this <laughs> is ridiculous. Yeah. I was like, nobody's getting anything done. I was like, we're walking around like, you know, and because they got the beach right there, it's sunny. They're like, things will get done. It just, that was hard for me in the beginning. And that laid back, kind of like casual, laissez faire really is true of that, of that city. And, you know, and so that was, a, that mm-hmm. was a bigger adjustment for me. So that by the time I finished there, moving to LA, LA is a little bit quicker and that type of thing. LA has got its own specific kind of energy and people and that kind of stuff too. So it was, it, it was still, it wasn't as jarring. LA wasn't as jarring, I think, cause I was in San Diego first. So I'd already been accustomed yeah. to like that very laid back, casual, whatever type of, you know, deal. Yeah. And it's, it's great that you had individuals out there who were supportive of you getting into acting. Cause I know like the, often the cliche is that, you know, both parents and, and friends will often try to discourage those persons who are trying to get into that field. You know, that the, the common, the common narrative is that, yeah. you know, you're never going to make it. Ah, you know, and I think it's great. You had some supportive people there. Were, you, were your parents encouraging of this or were they concerned about career prospects for you at the time? You know, I always remember them being encouraging. And I think because, you know, they always, they placed me in dance when I was really young. So I started off mm. as a dancer. You know, they put me in all, they were very good about throwing my brother and I in all kinds of activities. You know, we tried karate, piano lessons, voice lessons, dance. Like it was, you know, they wanted to see, they wanted to expose us to as much as they possibly could. And then that's when you find out what you really liked. Like, I really did like doing dance for a long time. I didn't, I don't think I ever saw myself as like being a professional dancer. But then when I, when I did acting, when I got to play the evil stepmother in like fifth grade, (laughs) I was like, Ooh, this is really fun. You can play like really villainous characters and like, and dress up (laughs) great costumes. I was like, this is real. And I was like, yep, this is what I want to do. And from then on, they were like, okay. And I was like, well, I, you know, I want to be in LA. And they were like, you're going to need an education and you should get trained in it. So I was like, oh, okay, well, but they were, and my friends are very supportive because they always, you know, they would, you know, we, they would be in shows with me or as we got older and stuff, you know, when I would be competing or that kind of stuff, they could clearly tell that it was like, it wasn't a fleeting hobby. It was like, no, this is what I would like to do. And, you know, that's all, that's all there was to it. So <laughs> hmm. wanted to get to the, at least this one last question before we kind of wrap up yeah. here. And that is for, for your readers, is there like, say 
and there might, I'm sure there's probably more than one, but you know, we'll just try to keep it down to one or if we can, is there, if there's one important takeaway that you would like the readers to walk away with after reading this book, what would that be? I think it would be to keep going after your dreams and follow in the Lord's footsteps for you. Like, I always believe that, that he has the divine master plan. So, and he has great intentions. So if you follow that and make sure that you just keep pursuing, you know, your purpose, then that is all you can, that's all you can do. That's the big takeaway to keep having that hope. Don't give up. That was Lorraine Chesley. Her new book, The Perfectly Imperfect Christian, is now available online wherever books are sold. Be sure and get your copy today. If you've been inspired by Lorraine's journey from actress to author, if you have a story that needs to be told, here at Blue Artists, we can work with you to help craft and publish a compelling story that stays true to your vision and message. Don't wait. Reach out to the Blue Artist team today and let your journey begin. I'm John Marble, and this has been Build Your Difference. Thanks for listening to this episode of Build Your Difference. If you'd like to learn more about how Blue Artists can help you develop a distinguished brand that inspires and engages a growing audience, then please visit us at www.blue-artist.com and be sure and subscribe to our monthly podcast for the latest tips and trends in brand development and marketing. And remember, you're not just making a brand, you're making a difference. Start building yours today.